looking for a fence. Sort of the gamesmith. In today's episode, we're going to be making two different types of fences a wattle fence and a split rail fence. Our supplies for our fences are quite basic. We have some wooden matchsticks from the dollar store. A single bag of 400 should be more than enough to create our split rail fence. We also have these jumbo craft sticks, which measure about 6 inches or 15 centimeters long and an inch or 2.5 centimeters wide. These jumbo craft sticks will serve as the base for both our split rail and our wattle fences. To begin, we're going to need some fence posts, so we can cut our 2 inch or 5 centimeter long matchsticks in half. Using a retractable craft knife, we're going to cut a number of these matchsticks depending on the design of our split rail fence. For my plan, we'll only need 4 1 inch posts for each fence. The cuts don't have to be precise. A rough cut will actually help with the rustic look of the fence posts. Next, we have a great many choices when it comes to gluing our fence together. Basic PVA glue works, but I really like tacky glue. And if we really want to get fancy, we could use some actual wood glue on our wooden matchsticks. Any of these glues and most other PVA based glues will work just fine. Now we need to plan a basic layout for our split rail fence. Using our jumbo craft sticks as the base, we want to plan how we're going to space our matchsticks in order to maximize the amount of space we create for our split rail fence. A split rail fence will crisscross at the joints and overlap each rail to create the height of the fence. As a result, you'll want to decide how tall you want your fence and how large you want your joints to be. That decided, I'm going to use some tacky glue in order to glue my first layer of fence rails to the base. I want the angle of the rails to cover as much of the base as possible, but also be roughly parallel and equidistant from one another. Once those are glued down, I add only the first row of cross rails and we apply the glue only at the ends of our rails. Then we place our matchsticks into the glue so that the ends crisscross each other and we let the glue dry for a few minutes before we move on to the next layer. The second layer starts in the middle with another split rail glued over the layer below. When it comes to the end of the fence, I suggest placing a matchstick perpendicular to the rail below it, which acts as a spacing guide, and then we glue the second fence rail above it. I'm going to use small paper clamps to hold the ends of our fence rails in place while the glue at the opposite end of our matchstick dries. We repeat this process back and forth across our build until we reach the fence height we want. When we reach the next layer, we simply remove the paper clamp to place our matchstick and replace it as needed. After the fence has reached the height we want and the glue has dried a bit, we can add our fence posts. I found the easiest method for completing this step is to simply remove the spacing sticks and press the paper clamp all the way over the end of the fence rails. We then add some glue to our fence posts along the edge that will be pressed against the fence. Using the paper clamp as a guide, we glue the fence posts to the rails. Once the fence posts on each side are completed, we can pull the paper clamp away from the fence posts so any excess glue doesn't bond to the clamp. Now this split rail fence is completed and we can let the glue dry before we decorate it. Using the same building techniques, we can build a gate section for our fence. The only difference is that we need a gap in the center for the gate. Skipping ahead, we can see how the fence rails are layered over each other to create the same height of fence. Next, we turn our attention to making the actual gate for our fence. First, we need nine matchsticks. Five will be our fence and the other four will be the separators to keep our fence rails parallel to each other. We lay the sticks out in a staggered pattern and then make sure that the ends are completely in line with one another. Now we add some glue to a shortened fence post and lay it across a section of the gate roughly one centimeter or a quarter of an inch from the edge. It's important that you let the glue dry a while before moving to the next step. You don't want the gate to fall apart while you're building it. 
Next we shift our separating guide rails to the other side of the gate so we can add another fence post. It's important that our fence posts on the gate are not too close to the outer edges. We want to be able to merge our gate with our fence when we're finished. Once the second gate post is mostly dry we can remove the separating rails and flip the gate over. We then lay the separating rails down perpendicular to our gate rails to support the gate while we add posts to the other side. We glue the shortened matchsticks on this side of the gate to match the gate posts on the opposite side. After both posts are affixed, we leave the gate to dry. Next I want to create a fence that has a broken section. Again we use the same building techniques that we did on our other split rail sections. The difference in our build occurs when we choose to add shortened and broken fence rails rather than use intact matchsticks. I suggest using some of the broken rails to act as a brace and glue them both to the fence and the base. This will help reinforce the structure and hold the fence up in areas where it's the weakest. You can use a variety of lengths of broken matchsticks and you need only have a broken rail or two to suggest the damage rather than collapsing the entire section like I'm doing. Even just a collection of ragged fence rails piled on the ground would work well. Now that the glue on all our fences is dried, we can remove the paper clamps and make sure that our fences are securely bonded together. We can also make sure that our gate fits into our open fence section. And it fits perfectly. Before we decorate our fence, we're going to build our wattle style fence. For the base of our wattle fence, we're going to use the same jumbo craft sticks we did earlier. However, these craft sticks are not very thick and bend quite easily. This presents a problem since we need to glue our fence posts directly to the base. We can't drill holes in the craft sticks because it will weaken the structure and likely split the board. At least that's what happened when I tried it. My solution to this problem is to use very thin wood dowels I found at the dollar store. We can use these dowels to create a type of trough on our base so the hold on our fence posts will be reinforced. I'm using this tacky glue again and applying it with my finger because I want complete coverage on the bottom of the dowel. We want to make sure that the guide dowels are in the middle of the base. I suggest using a matchstick to make sure the distance between the dowels is consistent. We then add some clamps to make sure the dowels don't shift or bend as the glue dries. If you don't have any carpenter's clamps, try paper clamps, or even wrapping several rubber bands tightly around the base several times. Also make sure to remove the matchsticks we used between the dowels. We don't want to glue anything into the trough that doesn't belong there. After the glue is completely dried and we remove our clamps, we have a much more sturdy base to add our fence posts. There are a number of methods for making a base like this, but I wanted to use the most basic materials and tools I could so as many crafters as possible could build a waddle fence. Now we can take our fence posts and dip them heavily into tacky glue and place them in our dowel trough. We want to separate the fence posts by an inch or two and a half centimeters from each other. The measurement doesn't have to be precise, so feel free to just eyeball it. We do, however, need to make sure that there are fence posts at either end of the base. After our fence posts have dried, we still have these gaps between the posts in our dowel trough. The glue holds these fence posts rather well, but you still may want to fill in these gaps for further support. We can easily accomplish this by cutting our matchsticks to size. We need only to eyeball the size since we can easily cut the stick to fit the space. Fill the gap in with some PVA glue and slide the fitted matchstick into the space. It should fit perfectly since we made the gaps the same width as the matchsticks. We need only repeat the process across all the gaps and the fence posts for our wattle fence will be that much stronger when the glue dries. Next we can use this garden wire I found at the dollar store to mimic the wooden sticks that are used to build an actual wattle fence. I like using wire for this because we can shape it and it holds that shape, which helps reinforce our fence. Also it has a plastic coating on the wire, so it's very easy to paint. Without the correct type of paint, metal wire doesn't hold paint very well and it tends to flake off over time. We need to measure how much wire we're going to need. Our base is 20 centimeters long. 
That's about seven and three quarters inches for our friends in the USA, Myanmar, and Liberia. Now we need a roughly equivalent length of wire. However, because we are weaving the wire between the fence posts, the wire should actually be longer. A length of 22 centimeters or eight and a half inches should be long enough to weave the wire and wrap it around the ends of our fence. We really only need to measure the wire once, and then we use the wire to compare all subsequent lengths when we cut them. Place the wire between the first two fence posts, leaving about a centimeter or a quarter of an inch past the end of the base. Then begin weaving the wire between the fence posts down the length of the base. As you do so, make sure to press the wire down onto the base so that there are no gaps. If you don't have any garden wire, you can use string or yarn instead. Also, rather than cutting the string or yarn into individual strips, you can just weave it through the fence posts, wrap it around the end and repeat the process until you've built up the height you want. When you're finished, you need only soak the string or yarn in PVA glue to reinforce the fibers. When it comes to the ends, don't wrap the wire around the final fence post yet. The last fence post tends to bend if we wrap the wire around it before we finish adding all the layers. Next, we take another piece of wire and repeat the process. However, we place the wire on the other side of the fence posts. We repeat this process back and forth until our fence reaches the height we want. Skipping to near the end of our build, we have only a layer or two left to add. Once our wire layers are finished, we press them down to remove any gaps in the fencing. We can also take a look at our fence posts and clip off any excess so that they're all relatively the same height. Next, we want to reinforce the hold our wire has on the posts. Starting at one of the ends, make sure that the wire crisscrosses over each layer, so the wires stack on top of each other. We want each wire to stay in place, so push the wire down and hold it in place with a paper or wood clamp. Next, we apply some PVA glue to the wire over top of the fence post. I'm using a brush to make sure the glue gets down into the tiny spaces. At the very least, we should do this on the ends of our wattle fence. However, you may want to add some PVA to each fence post or across the top layer where the wire touches the post. That's up to you. After the glue is dried, we can remove the paper clamps and bend the excess garden wire around the fence post at each end. We don't want to bend the fence post by tightly wrapping the wire around it. It helps to start bending the wire with the bottom layer and work your way up, which is not what I did here. In this case, do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> if need be, we can use some wire cutters to shorten the wire before we start bending it around the ends of our fence. Next, we can start decorating our fences. We'll start by adding some tacky glue to our jumbo craft stick bases. Try to keep the glue you get on your fence rails to a minimum, or gently wipe it off the fence after you've applied a heavy layer of glue. Now we can cover our bases with a three stone aggregate that we use quite a lot here at the Gamesmith. We want more of the smaller particles than any other size. A few of the larger aggregate stones are okay, but we don't want to overcrowd our base. We cover the making of this aggregate in our basic mixtures video. I'll put a link in the corner if you're interested in checking that out. I suggest letting this glue dry for at least four hours. Now we can remove the excess aggregate. I suggest using a brush to make sure that we get all those little particles free. You can use a craft knife to scrape off the particles glued to the features you don't want covered. Next, because I know how much abuse my terrain takes at the game table, I'm going to add another layer of glue to reinforce the hold on the aggregate. I used a heavily watered mixture for this glue layer. It's a 70-30 mixture and it's very runny. Make sure you let the fences dry on a non-stick material so you don't glue the fences to your work surface. You might also consider placing a flat surface on the top of the fences and weighing them down so that the thin wooden base doesn't warp as the water and the glue dries. A fan or two blowing on them will help speed up the process too. I let the fences dry overnight and our aggregate is well bonded to the base. I can wiggle the larger rocks and there is no give to them. We can also see that there is little to no warpage on the wooden base. The same applies to our wattle fences. The aggregate is securely glued and the base didn't warp. Next I want to base coat our fences and to do that I'm going to use this Army Painter Primer. I'm choosing this skeleton brown color because I like the tan brown for the cut wood features of our fences. Cut wood is tan to white in color and most aged wood is gray. 
so I want to choose a color that actually looks like wood rather than just a basic brown. Here are our fences after they've been primed and base coated with our skeleton bone spray paint. All the surfaces are the same color, but now we can layer different colors on top of the base coat to create a relatively convincing scattered terrain fence. We want to paint the fences first to create the best features we can, so if there's any mess on the base, we will end up covering it later. We're going to start with a standard dry brushing layer on our fences. We load our brush with very little paint and remove the excess on a napkin and drag the brush over our build. We'll use a lighter brown like cinnamon so the tiny surface textures just pop out on our fences. We have a foundations video on different dry brushing techniques you may want to check out if you're unfamiliar with this painting method. We use the same technique on our wattle fence, but we need to be more careful with our paint. This is because the plastic coating on the wire doesn't have any texture on it. We have to use less paint in our brush so that the fence doesn't end up with a splotchy appearance. Next we switch to a burnt umber or a dark brown to add some earthly color to our base. Any bargain paint will do just fine, we just want to add some darker areas and cover the exposed edges of the base. We're not looking for complete coverage, rather a kind of desert camouflage pattern will work best. Next we're going to add a tan dry brush to our bases using the same technique we did with our fences. All the tiny aggregate rocks will capture the tan paint and really highlight the darker brown beneath. Of course you can choose whatever color palette you want, but I wanted an earthy, rustic and dirty look around the fences. Now we will tackle the large rocks that we glued to our bases. We'll use this graphite or dark grey color on the stones. We can draw paint right from the container and coat the largest stones on the bases. The dark grey will really break up the brown colors we've used so far. If you're unhappy with where some of the grey paint has ended up, just use a clean brush soaked in water to clean up the mess, and then use a clean dry brush to soak up the water. You may want to add a dark wash to your rocks, base or fence at this point, or all of them, but I've chosen not to. Next, using some PVA glue, we're going to add some different colored turfs to our base. Using a ratty old brush, we can spread some PVA glue around our fence. When adding the turf, I suggest using two different colors and leaving areas of the brown base exposed. I also suggest that you avoid covering the rocks we painted. After our turf is dried, we can remove the excess. We can add our final decoration, which is some clump foliage. I have some woodland scenic clump foliage left over from other builds, and will attach it to the base with some tacky glue. If you can, use at least two colors and avoid covering up all the earthly brown areas on the base. We want some dirty patches to show through. You might also experiment with tall grasses, vines, or other foliage to liven up your fences. Now that all our parts are dried, here we have our completed fences. I'm very happy with how these two varieties of fencing turned out. These fences will work well on the table for encounters in the late spring, summer, and early fall months. These can be used for an urban garden, animal pens, orchard fences, barriers along a country road, and so on and I can definitely use them to create difficult terrain or block lines of sight. I've seen these types of fences around tabletop war games for many years, and so I don't think I've brought anything entirely new to this build. However, I hope you found this tutorial helpful and informative. If you'd like to support us here at the Gamesmith, there are a number of ways you can do that. If you haven't already subscribed, now is a great time. Hit the thumbs up button and give us a like. Ask a question or leave a comment below. Join us on social media like Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest. Check out our website at thegamesmith.org. Read our free monthly blog and purchase a t-shirt or a coffee mug. Check out our supply list for each of our videos, which have an Amazon affiliate link to make online purchases for whatever you want or need at Amazon. It really helps out the channel. Finally, you can join Patreon, which gives you access to content like our podcasts, and exclusive videos. Your support in any form is much appreciated. Until next time, I'll see you at the table.